Has there ever been a moment in time where you should have said no, but you said yes? <laughs> Were you ever at a place where everything inside of you was screaming to say no, but instead you said yes? What makes us do that? A lot of times we're feeling pressure. We are feeling pressured by others. We know it's not the right decision, but we can't stand up to them and we end up saying yes when we should say no. The Apostle Paul is reviewing a moment in time back in Acts chapter 15 when Paul comes to Jerusalem and the leaders in the Jerusalem church where the church started wanted to circumcise all of the men Gentile believers saying, if you are saved, in order to be saved, you must be circumcised. Now imagine if that went through, we would have the first church of the circumcision, right? Why is Paul reviewing this story with the churches in Galatia, in this region of northern Turkey? Because they're at a decision point, a cross roads where they're considering going back to legalism. And Paul's saying, no, we've been here. God showed us we were at this place of trying to make a decision as a church and the Lord led us in freedom. And when Paul is encouraging this group of believers is to say no to legalism, to say no to this idea, this teaching that it's Jesus plus works, that you have to do this system of works in order to be saved. Let's look at verse one. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and I also took Titus with me. The end of chapter three told us that Paul went to Jerusalem after three years of his conversion, but now it's a whole 14 years later that he returns to Jerusalem for the second time. So 17 years and only two visits to Jerusalem, Paul didn't spend the majority of his time in Jerusalem. I think his heart wanted to. He's a Jew of Jews. He was one who was trained in the schools of Judaism, set his heart apart in that direction. And when he got saved, he wanted to see the Jews come to know the Lord, even to the point where he said, I'm willing to be accursed for the Jewish people to be saved. But that wasn't his calling. God called him to go to the Gentiles, so he didn't spend a lot of time in Jerusalem. Who's Barnabas? You may recall from the book of Acts, he's the son of encouragement. It's what Barnabas means. That's what his name means. And God used Barnabas to come alongside Paul and say, Paul, I need you. Would you come and help me? There's all of these new believers. And Paul's life would not have been the same if it wasn't for the encouragement of Barnabas. The church would have not been nearly as healthy if it wasn't for the apostle Paul engaging. So God was glorified through the encouragement of Barnabas. We need encouragers. If you're like Barnabas, where you enjoy coming alongside of people and encouraging them, do that to the glory of God. Because Paul's are made through Barnabas's and not everybody's a Paul. Not everybody's going to go out and have that public ministry like the Apostle Paul, but God uses Barnabas's as well. Who's Titus? Titus is a young man who was a Gentile who got saved under Paul's ministry, and he chose to labor with Paul, go on these missionary journeys. And as a, a Gentile, there was this pressure for him to be circumcised. And in fact, in Acts 15, it's Titus who comes with Paul and Barnabas to this Jewish council where they're trying to make decisions of how do we treat Gentile believers? What burdens do we put upon? Restrictions do we put upon Gentile believers? So Titus is living proof of God saving the Gentiles and he's present in this Acts 15 discussion. In verse two, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach amongst the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So Paul shares that it was the leading of the Spirit that caused him to make this trip to Jerusalem. It was by revelation that he came. And what did he want to communicate? He wanted to communicate what God had done amongst the Gentile world, how the gospel had spread and churches were planted. 
And he shares that publicly, but he also meets privately with the leaders, those who are of reputation, because Paul wants to make sure that he's not running in vain. Now, if you're taking notes, write this down, is ask the hard question, am I running in vain? I think it's significant that when Paul comes to Jerusalem, he doesn't just assume that he has everything right. He says, no, I want to get the leaders, get the elders, and share with them what God's doing amongst the Gentiles, share my heart that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but I'm open to this fact that I'm possibly running in vain. And this seems to be a theme for the Apostle Paul. He brings it up several times in his writings. In Philippians 2, he says he's holding on to the word of life so that he might not run in vain. He's holding on to the word of God, making the word of God his anchor so he doesn't run in vain. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says that he brings his body under subjection. He disciplines his own body so that he's not disqualified. He doesn't want to be disqualified in this race that God has called him to. Now let's think about for a moment how frustrating it would be to run in vain. I read an article this week about a marathon runner in Orange County. He ran the Orange County Marathon and he won with just a crazy, ridiculous time of like two hours and 26 minutes. That's 26.2 miles. I mean, just, just flying. But he eventually got disqualified because his dad was riding alongside of him on a bike. You can watch videos of it. What a cool dad, right? He's riding his bike next to his son and his dad would hand him water throughout the race, which was against the rules. You were only allowed to get water from the water stations or carry it. And because they broke the rules, then he's disqualified. I mean, how disheartening. Like you, you have that, whoo, I won, not really. You, you've been disqualified. In the article, it talked about months and months and months of training where he would run 100 miles a week. So much work went to that moment, but it resulted in him being disqualified because he didn't follow the rules. I think of it this way. I enjoy hunting. My son and I are looking forward to going hunting. It's getting cooler in the evenings, which means one thing. Not football, hunting season. It means hunting season, right? Well, the first year I went elk hunting in Colorado, I'd gotten my 30-06. And if you're not familiar with hunting and hunting rifles, a lot of them have a magazine that you clip in on the bottom where your bullets are, which is your reservoir of, of bullets. So you can have one in the chamber and then your magazine. It was cold, it was snowy. One night there was a lot of snow that came in, about 17 inches and I'm out hunting and I guess I didn't get the magazine in firmly enough and the magazine fell out at some point and all of a sudden my gun became a single shot. <laughs> and I'm not a good enough shot to just have a single shot when it comes to an elk. And we didn't end up seeing any elk, but I was so discouraged. All this preparation that had gone in and here I was the idiot of the year that lost my magazine to, to my gun. Imagine if you went out hunting and you forgot your bullets. That's something I would do. <laughs> months and months of work and preparation and then get up there and you're like, man, I don't have my bullets. That's running in vain, right? So Paul, in his wisdom, is stopping and evaluating and saying, am I running in vain? We're very busy as a culture. We run, but sometimes we don't pause to stop and say, where am I actually headed? What race am I trying to win? And is it possible that I'm running in vain? Now, what would cause Paul to run in vain if he got the gospel wrong? What if... These Gentiles did actually have to be circumcised to be saved. What if they did have to go under the, the law? Then Paul would be running in vain. We also know that if compromise entered into Paul's life, that could cause him to be disqualified where people wouldn't listen to the message that Paul, Paul shared. So we want to pause in our lives and go, do I have it right on the gospel? Do I understand how I'm saved and others saved? And is there possible compromise in my life that could cause me to run in vain? It's worth pausing. It's, it's worth asking this, this hard question. We go on into verse three. 
Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. As they come in, in Acts chapter 15, those Jewish believers are saying, you must be circumcised in order to be saved. Titus wisely rejects. Titus says no. Notice the way that this was phrased and formed in Acts 15. It's not if you'd like to be circumcised, if this is something that the Lord leads you to do. This wasn't anything to do with health concerns. This is a matter of salvation. That's the way it was presented. In order to be saved, you have to be circumcised. And any time that we add works to the gospel, we've missed it. It's gospel plus works equals error, equals false teaching. Is there a place for good works in our lives? Absolutely, the Bible teaches that. Faith results in good works, but it's a response to salvation. It's a response to what God has done, not a responsibility in order to earn or deserve a salvation. We look at verse four, and this occurred because of false brethren seekingly brought, secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. There's actually those that are coming into the body in these churches, and they're false brethren. They look like brothers and sisters in Christ. They talk like brothers and sisters in Christ, but they don't eat like brothers and sisters in Christ. They eat sheep. They devour sheep. There are these legalists that are coming in and they're actually looking at people's freedom that they have in Christ, looking at their liberty that they have in Christ and intentionally trying to bring them under the law, bring them under bondage. And notice that they come in secretly. Now, somebody that has the right intent, that is honoring the Lord, they're not gonna be walking around the body of Christ in secret. John 10 talks about Jesus being the shepherd and the door. And he says the shepherd uses the door, but those that come in to rob and steal, they're gonna try to come in another way. Beware of somebody that's creeping around the church in secret. And normally it happens in a very spiritual tone. When I find somebody whispering out in the foyer, you know, they're having this really spiritual, private conversation where they're whispering out in the foyer. I'm always like, what are you up to? Because if it was really the right thing, there would no, be no reason to be acting in secret. But a lot of times the conversation is something like this. I notice your, your love for the Lord. You're so faithful to come on Sundays at nine and, and you serve in, in the church and you want to grow in Christ. Well, we've got a Navy SEALs Bible study for you, for those that want to go deeper in Christ. But here's the buy-in. You, you've got to commit to fasting every Friday. I mean, no vegetables, no cucumbers, no coffee. You have to fast in order to be part of this Bible study. But we wanted you to be in it because you're a little bit extra spiritual. Run for your life. <laughs> Tell them to pack sand or bite the wall. You know, it's like, why are you going around in secret and you've got this secret Bible study and this secret club for those that are really diligent to Christ? They probably have an agenda where they actually want to rob you of your liberty. And this is hard for us to process sometimes that there could actually be people that come into the body of Christ that are wanting to bring about false teaching. In verse 5 to whom we didn't yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Point number two is guard your freedom by rejecting legalism. Paul says we didn't put up with this for even an hour. Now remember, Paul had the humility to ask the hard question, am I running in vain? Did I get this issue wrong? But in understanding that he was in line with the gospel, that this was actually an affront to the gospel, he said no, and he wouldn't yield to it even for an hour because he wanted the Gentiles to be able to continue in the gospel. This idea of guarding your freedom, guarding your liberty that God gave to you in Christ, it's actually proactive. If you guard something, it's, it's going to involve action. It's going to 
involve being intentional. And so it's, it's looking for this legalistic teaching that comes in and guarding yourself against it so you can remain in the freedom of Christ. I had an 18 year old ask me this question this week. It was a great question, a young man. And he's saying, I really want to follow God. I want to honor the Lord. I want God to use my life for his kingdom. And and I'm wrestling with what place does watching a movie that's not educational have in my life? Can, Can I do that because I want my time to be used to glorify God? It's like, is there any place in the life of a believer to just enjoy playing a video game? So I looked at him and I said, you know, video games are done for you. All movies must be educational. (laughs) No, I was like, this is important. This is a great question. And there are times as a believer to be able to sit down and watch a movie and it doesn't have to be educational. A movie that's honoring to the Lord, but it's just a chance to unplug and just a chance to enjoy yourself, enjoy your family and your friends and enjoy playing a video game, right? And be able to be refreshed in that way and it actually comes into this concept of rest, that God's designed us for rest. Now, if you were to play video games all the time and watch videos all the time, that would be the excess, but sometimes we go too far the other way. But legalism would tell you, hey, if you're gonna watch a movie, it has to be educational. In fact, it can't even be educational. It, it must be biblical, only biblical movies for you. And my goodness, if you play video games, you have lost your salvation or maybe you're not even saved, right? <laughs> and so we gotta watch our own hearts and, and guard our hearts against legalism. But sometimes I think we're actually the biggest threat to this ourselves. Somewhere we get mixed up and we get messy thinking when it comes to the gospel and we start to think, you know what? God's love and favor towards me is dependent upon me reading my Bible. Like, do you feel that God loves you a little bit more if you start the day with reading your Bible? If you don't read your Bible, do you feel, still think that the Lord's with you and he still loves you? That's the gospel. The gospel is the Lord loves us, period, not based on our works. But we tend to put works to it. Well, well, Lord, I'm tithing. And so because I'm tithing and I'm giving my first fruits to you, I feel that you love me. Yeah, give as the Lord leads, but God's love for us doesn't change based upon our works. But we will fall into a system of legalism and the gospel is always going to take us back to the finished work of Christ. And if we're in that place of trusting what Christ has done in his love, the response is so much sweeter. God, I get to read my Bible this morning. I know that you love me either way or not, but I want to draw near to you. God, I want to give of finances because you've saved me and you've been so gracious to me. So Take the time to guard our hearts against legalism. In verse six, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Don't be swayed by powerful people. Don't be swayed by powerful people. This is quite a statement from the apostle Paul is he comes in, he says, you know what? I'm not gonna be impressed by Peter. I'm not gonna be impressed by, by James. I'm not gonna be impressed by the elders in Jerusalem. This is an issue of truth and God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't show favoritism. And this is amazing to me to think that God doesn't show favoritism. If I'm honest, there's a part of me that goes, God must have loved Billy Graham more than he loves me. You know. Billy Graham's amazing and God used him in such a a powerful way and preached the gospel to more than anyone else probably in all of history. God must have a special place for, for Billy Graham. Now, obviously the Lord used Billy Graham, but God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't put people up on a higher pedestal and then on those on a lower pedestal. And for us to understand the gospel, also affects how we see ourselves and how we we see others. And we tend to look down on some people and then over elevate other people. So why is it that I'm looking down upon you? 
How is it that I've sized you up where I now am looking down upon this person? And why is it that I have chosen to elevate this person? And what does the gospel do? The gospel is the great equalizer where we're equal footing before Jesus at the cross. We're all sinners that need grace that are saved by the blood of Jesus. It's gonna keep us from being bond servants of Christ. It's gonna keep us from saying no when we need to. It's gonna keep us from rejecting legalism if we've put people on a, on a pedestal. Is there powerful people that you have a hard time being yourself around? Why is that, right? You know, it's interesting for me is sometimes it's hard to be comfortable around a big group of other pastors. If I go to a pastor's conference or a pastor's lunch, there's, there's a part of me that's, I want to be thought well of by other pastors. Well, what's that all about? It, it's me thinking of myself. It's me caring too much what these other pastors think about me. And to be able to be free in Christ to say, no, who am I really trying to please? I'm trying to please the Lord. And that's what Paul talked about in Galatians 1 verse 8. So we want to resist this temptation to not be swayed by powerful people. But on the contrary, when they saw the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, they make this observation that God has called Paul to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. And just as God was using Peter amongst the Jews, God was using Paul amongst the Gentiles, two different callings, two different people groups, but the same gospel. And thankfully in Acts chapter 15, is that the leaders started to embrace what was taking place amongst Gentile believers. And that's what was really hard for them was to accept that God loved the Gentiles the same way that he loved the Jews. In verse eight, for he who worked in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. Last point is live out what God has wor worked in. Live out what God has worked in. What Paul is saying is God had worked powerfully in the life of Peter for him to be an apostle to the Jews. But then God also worked powerfully in Paul's life for him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But it was different callings, different callings. So what is God working in your heart? In Philippians chapter two, Paul says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But the next statement is so important for it's God who works within us to will and do his good pleasure. So God is actually working in our hearts what he wants us to live out. So as you think about this in your, your life, what is it that you're really passionate about and step out in those things? If you go to bed at night, what do you tend to be burdened with? What do you think about? What do you, what do you pray for? Is your heart really for kids, for this next generation, for them to be safe and for them to know Jesus? Then that's probably a calling from the Lord. And you should step into that and look for ways to, to serve kids. And it may be that the Lord's leading you to children's ministry. If you do not like kids, please do not sign up for our children's <laughs> ministry. And to be honest about that, like, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for kids, but I don't really like kids and they tend to drive me nuts. Like, we don't want you in the children's ministry, right? Are you one that what's on your heart is you want to help people. You just want to help people. You, you see a need and you want to meet that, that need. It's like, man, my neighbor really needs help with building their fence. Or I've got a friend that could use help getting their brakes done on their car and you're wired that way. I, the, hey, the, they need help moving and I want to step in and help them move. Well, you probably have the gift of helps. So that's what God has worked mightily in you. And God wants to use that to be a witness to unbelievers and to encourage uh, believers. Some of you, what burdens you is mercy and compassion. You love showing mercy. And your biggest complaint with the world is people are not merciful. Well, live that out. 
is take the time to weep with those who weep and, and show mercy. When we're suffering, we all love somebody that has the gift of, of mercy. Maybe you just love to give. You love to give. That's why you got so excited about the Christmas announcement a few moments ago. And sometimes you'll even abuse your budget because you love to give so much. Well, that's a calling from the Lord. And so give cheerfully unto the Lord. But the key is, is live out what God is working in your heart. And it's not going to be like the person next to you. What if Peter would have said, I've got to be like Paul. What if Paul said, I've got to be like Peter. And one of the things that we see about the body of Christ is Jesus is the head. It's the same gospel. It's the same message. It's the same Lord and Savior. It's the same spirit living inside of us. But we're many members. And Paul's example is the body of Christ. And we think of our physical bodies. And thankfully, each part of our body is willing to do its own function. Its own function. But what if the toe wanted to be the hand? What if the big toe wanted to be the nose? That would be awkward, right? Thankfully, the big toe is content to be the big toe. And apparently, it's important. If you lose your big toe, your balance really goes all out of, of whack. So what is it this morning that God is really working in your heart? And it can be in the church, but also outside of the church. Maybe you just love fitness, and fitness is your thing. How do you use that for the glory of God? Maybe you love to hike and love to get out into the outdoors. How can you bring people alongside of you to go hiking with you to, to share the gospel or encourage uh, believers? Maybe your thing is gardening. What a blessing. Invite people to garden with you. Bless them with some zucchini. Every aspect of like, why do I have this interest? I'm convinced one of the greatest ways to reach men's hearts is through cars and vehicles and motorcycles. Like if you're a car guy, use that for the glory of God. You're gonna have the heart of other men. They're gonna be eating out of your hand. And as they are, point them to the gospel, point them to, to Christ. So what's in your heart? What is it that really gets you excited that's from the Lord. He's worked that in you and use it for God's glory. In verse nine, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. So the leaders in Jerusalem accepted what God was doing between Paul and Barnabas. They welcomed them into fellowship. In verse 10, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was eager to do. Acts 15, they said to these Gentile believers, you don't have to be circumcised. And there was a sigh of relief. They're like, phew. They didn't lay any burdens upon them. The simple instruction was, remember the poor. And Paul was eager to do that. And this wasn't a requirement for salvation. It wasn't, hey, you have to remember the poor in order to be saved. This is a response to the gospel that we're all poor before God and God is gracious to forgive us of our sins. And so look for those who are in need. And Paul says, I, I'm eager to do this. Few questions. The first is, Let's ask this hard question. Am I running in vain? Am I running in vain? Am I possibly spinning my wheels? Am I not taking the time to consider how am I running? What's the goal? What am I running towards? Are we getting water from the wrong source and it's causing us to be disqualified? Are we out hunting without any bullets? It's like, man, I... I didn't even bring any ammunition to this hunting trip. Am, am I running the race in vain? And then guard your freedom. Has, has legalism crept in? Do you feel guilty for taking a nap? Maybe your application to this message this morning is take a nap in Jesus' name. <laughs> like allow yourself to, to rest. You, maybe today you need to watch a movie that's not educational and cook up some popcorn and know that the Lord is with you in, in that moment. 
Maybe you don't read your Bible one day and you rest in the fact that God loves you unconditionally. Don't be swayed by powerful people. Are you walking around on pins and needles when you come around a certain person because you perceive them to be of reputation? You perceive them to be powerful. Is there somebody that maybe you're looking up to in an unhealthy manner? Is there possibly somebody that you're looking down upon? And then lastly, I think the fun part is work out what God's worked in. Maybe you've been trying to be somebody that you're not and it's just not working. Maybe it's time to turn in your resignation for children's ministry. Or maybe it's time to join children's ministry. And to say, look, this is really just not who I am. This is not who God has, has made me to be, but I think this is over here. And sometimes that happens through trial and error. You try something, you start serving at work, in your neighborhood, in the church, and, and as you serve, you start to understand, okay, this is what I'm wired for. This is what the Lord has put into my heart and put into my life. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We thank you for the gospel. Lord, would you guard our hearts, help us to be on the offensive when it comes to, to legalism. May we truly understand the place of good works in our lives where we get to respond to your goodness, but you're not our employer. We're not the employee. We're not trying to earn things from, from you. Holy Spirit, would you help to identify those things that you've called us to? Lord, we invite you to write your will upon our hearts. Would you work within us? Lord, if there's things that we need to start saying no to and other things that we need to start saying yes to, we, we invite you to do that. God, we desire that you would use our lives for your glory. Would you give us opportunities to share your goodness and the gospel with unbelievers this week to encourage believers? Let's just wait upon the Lord for a moment. Here's one of the dangers I think that happens with church. It's the R word. It's called routine. And we tend to be a pretty routine fellowship. And there's some good aspects to that. But we have our patterns. We have our for worship songs, our worship, our teaching, and then our last song. And I think a lot of times in the last song, it's really easy to disconnect and think about what we've got for the rest of the day or how we can get better pole position in the parking lot. But the reason we have a last song is to wait upon the Lord, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, to the seven churches, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. What did God speak to you today through the message? Maybe there's something that didn't even relate to the message that is on your heart today. You woke up thinking about it. You woke up where it was on your heart, driving to church, it was on your mind. There's something that the Lord wants to, to share with you. Also, at this point in our service, we want to bear one another's burdens. We want to pray together. And as Billy leads us in worship, if, if you need prayer, if you've had a tough week, you've gotten some hard news, a difficult diagnosis, lost your job, that's, that's what we're here for. We want to pray together. Come and, and receive prayer. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we don't want to assume that everybody here has said yes to Jesus. Has Jesus died for you specifically? Isn't that amazing? He went to the cross for you and was punished for your sins. And Jesus invites you to turn from sin, to repent, and to believe that he's God and invite him to be the Lord of your life, which means you're allowing him to take control. You're saying, Jesus, I'm ready for you to be in charge. Have you gotten to a place where you're just tired of trying to be in charge of your own life, where you're actually created for Jesus to be your Lord? Whether you go to heaven or hell hinges on this decision to receive Christ. And as we sing, you come, come down. Prayer team's gonna be available here on the sides and let us know, I'd like to receive Christ as my savior. If you've got questions, 
Let's dive into those. You can respond online. There's a team that's ready to pray. There's also a team that's ready to pray with you if you receive the gospel. But let's just wait. Let's, let's wait upon the Lord. Let's listen to the Lord. This promise from God, if, if we will draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. There's, there's too many times for me where I come into church and I leave church and I haven't drawn near to the Lord. I can go through a whole entire service and be somewhere else. And so for us to say, Lord, I'm here. I'm not just checking a box and, and I wanna draw near to you. So Jesus, we do thank you for your promise right now as we draw near to us, that as we draw near to you, that you'll draw near to us. And the Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would speak, that you would really confirm the things that we've heard in the word. Lord, where we need correction, would you provide it? Where we need encouragement, would you give it? So we wait upon you.